And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on it, put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be able to do that thing which is least, why take we thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither they toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothe the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that you have need of these things. In short, he's just telling us, trust God. Amen. Trust God. Yes. If we trust him, he will not let us go hungry. Amen? We may not know where our money's going to come from. We're doing all that we know to do to take care of ourselves. How many know if we're trusting in God, He'll make sure our needs are met? Amen. How many have experienced that? You don't have to have a lot of money in the natural bank to have a lot of money in the bank. Amen. If you're trusting God, if you're doing what you believe He has led you to do, how many know what you need will be there when you need it? Yes. If what you're believing for or the direction that you feel you need to be going isn't of God, how many know He will let you know? Yes. Sometimes we think we're supposed to be doing something and it's not. But if we acknowledge, if we trust the Lord and acknowledge Him in all of our ways, He will direct our path. Amen. I remember... Uh, years ago, when I was a young evangelist, um, there was, I'd lost my job. I couldn't get a job. Scripture says God's the one that opens doors that no man can close, and God's the one that closes doors that no man can open. I could not get a job. All of a sudden, doors of ministry opened up. And so I started going out and preaching. And for a time, God was providing our needs. The offerings was enough to, to live upon. And in a convention, I knew Sister Van Austin. We were fairly close. Um, she was friends of the Undersingers. And... Uh, uh, she was in my in our home many times. We went out to Sedgwick, Colorado when she was out there. And we was in a convention in Decatur, Illinois. And uh, there was David Hulse, myself, uh, Sister Van Austin, I forget who else that, that were the uh, main speakers. 
And Sister Van Austin had asked me to come. She, that she'd, her and, uh, and uh, some others had started a church in West Palm Beach, Florida. And they wanted me to come down there and do five nights worth of meetings. And so everything was looking good. But God was changing my direction. But all the doors were open, so I was just going right through them. Well, this was before I was married to Judy and was having a little problems at home. And a young man, a friend of ours, come, drove over to see me, and he said God had given him a word for me. And he said, God wants you off the road now, and you need to get a job and stay, stay at home. There's, you need to just be there with your family. Well, I had put in all kinds of applications everywhere. Could not find a job. And Springfield, Missouri is a college town. You've got two, three Bible colleges and a state university and some other colleges there. So, you know, sometimes jobs are hard to find. Everybody's looking for jobs. And I was a little rough on him. I said, I've got five meetings down in Florida. And, uh, you know, I put in applications everywhere. There's no work. And when it comes time to go, I'm going to go there. And so, he said, well, I'm just doing what the Lord told me to do. No sooner than he left, and Sister Van Austin called and said things had changed, and they couldn't have me. And uh, so the, the doors were closed. Then all of a sudden, a factory called Lytton, there in Springfield, called me up and uh, called me in for an interview for a job. Well, you got to keep their, your application current there. And I did not keep my application current there. So it was over a year since I applied. I shouldn't have been called. I went in. Bang. I got the job. I had to kind of go apologize to uh, the brother that gave me the prophecy because I was a little rough on him. But he was obeying the Lord and er and. God closed the doors, and he opened a job. And I had that job until, until Judy and I got married. And uh, when it was time for us to leave Springfield, that job come to an end, and I got laid off. Point is, When you trust in God, you may, I mean, the doors were open. As far as I knew, that was God's will. And it was until a certain time. And just like the word of the Lord that the brother prophesied to me, God closed that door and opened another. Well, praise the Lord. I'm saying as if we are trusting God, He will provide our needs. When I first, my first trip to Haiti, I was not really even planning on going. Uh, I had preached, I had preached for uh, Brother Julian in the Florida area for about a month. Uh, I mean, I was, they preached me every single night. And, man, there's a lot of Haitian churches down there. 
you know, and so and they all, they, and uh, they all liked me. And brothers, said, you need to come to Haiti. Well, I didn't have finances to go to Haiti. Well, we were at that time. I was only driving about four days a week. We had uh, meetings in Jim's home on Wednesday night, which was the beginning of this church. We had meetings in Evansville, Arkansas on Tuesday night. And, of course, we had our services in Haskell that we were part of. I had a radio broadcast. And then uh, we were having, you know, a lot of fellowship meetings back then on Fridays. And so um, when we were in Evansville, and Evansville... When we first started going there, probably had less people in it than we got in here tonight or today. But God did kind of move, and we had some young people come to know the Lord. And there for a while, we got, we got up between 40 and 50 people. You know, most young, young people, and they were hungry and hearing the message. Well, then the enemy came in because other pastors wanted them in their church. And so then the war started, and it Dwindled, dwindled down and unfortunately many of them ended up just going right back out into the world because of all the fussing and the fighting but uh, one night I was there wasn't as many people there as are here today and I just pray, asked them to pray didn't ask them for no money I just just prayed, I've got some open door, an open door to go to Haiti. And I just want to know if it's God's will for me to go and just pray that if it's God's will, he'll let me know and the finances will be there. Just ask him for prayer. And a little lady in the back, well, young lady, Sister Shelley, she just writes me out a check for $400 for Haiti. Didn't ask for that. But I asked for prayer. Asked for direction. Well, that sounds to me like a direction. So I shared it at Haskell Wednesday night. And Gary gets up and Raises an offering. And you know Haskell's not that big either. And there was no twisting people's arms. You know Gary's good about raising money. He knows how to. But he just put the need out there. And they took up an offering. I think Jim was there. $500. So now I got 900 bucks. This is in 2002. Then Melissa comes, my daughter, and gives me $600. And so it, in, a, in a matter of days, I've got all the money I need to go to Haiti. So then I called Brother Julian and said, okay, I'm coming. God opened the door. It hasn't always been that easy. But you know, any time God has wanted to be over there, the money came. Sometimes it would be right down to the very wire. But God come through. But when we're not, when it's not His will, He'll let us know. And if you're Stubborn and star and and hard headed, like I have been, a few times. He'll do it in such a way you can't miss it. Like when the brother prophesied to me, immediately afterwards I go in the house, I got a phone ring, the phone come, and those doors that were open slam shut. Okay. And I don't know whether it was that day or the very next day, Lytton calls me, you got a job. (laughs) 
God knows how to direct us. We don't have to worry about things. How many know what worry is? It's it's fear. It is the opposite of faith. And that's what this way say. You can worry all you want to. It won't add one cubit to your stature. It is a waste of time. You can go to the Lord and pray. Tell Him what you need. And then just leave it in his hands and see if he doesn't provide a job, whatever it is that you need, he'll provide. Doesn't mean you don't have to go out looking or something, but you just trust him. By the way, that's not really what I was going to preach on today, but I think it's good. Amen? But this is what he says, verse 29. Or verse 30. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that you have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be added unto you. Seek the kingdom of God. What is seeking the kingdom of God? It's seeking His will for your life. Seeking His will for your life. But I read all that just to get to this one point. Verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. To give you the kingdom. What is the kingdom? Well, yes, eventually the kingdom of God is to rule the entire world. Can somebody say amen? But where is the kingdom? You. Me, we are the kingdom. These bodies that we live in, we are to rule and control. Because how many know God doesn't just come in and rule arbitrary? We are joint heirs together. Can somebody say amen? Amen. We've got to rule with him. He reveals to us his will, how we're to live our lives. He opens the doors that he wants us to go through. He closes the doors that we're not to go through. And as we live our lives in accordance to his will, think the way he thinks. You want to know something about God? I used to always say, well, you know, I bet you that the way we live just really upsets God. You know what? God in his foreknowledge knew how all of us were going to live. I don't think we shake him a bit. He don't approve when we do things wrong. Can somebody say Amen. But God sees beyond our fault. He sees beyond our wrong decisions that we have made. And if we love God and we're called according to His purpose, what did He say? All things will work together for our good. Even our wrong choices. Now God never caused us To make those wrong choices. Can somebody say amen? Amen. But he will use those wrong choices for good. If we love him. 
and are called according to his purpose. But as Jim says, in the kingdom you can't make a mistake. It is if you learn from your mistake. Now, if you harden your heart and don't learn, well, it ain't going to work for your good. There's going to be a change. It has to happen somewhere. Amen? But when that change happens, even your wrong choice will work together for your good. I don't know about you. There's some things in my lives, in my life, I know I will never, ever do again. Now, I do not have to doubt that one bit. I mean, God's delivered me from some things, and I just, well, this was an experience I had years ago when, not Judy, I was, this was long before I met Judy, when my first wife was unfaithful. And worst of all, with at the time, my best friend. And the thought came to me. Why don't you just go out and get drunk? Others do. God understands. And he brought people to my rem remembrance that did. Some were elders in the church. They went through a time. At, well, this is one of those type moments. Why don't you just go out and get drunk? So I thought about it. I grew up around bars. My mom worked at the Moose Club, a religious institution for those who drink. When they get drunk and spend all their money, they can feel good about themselves because all the money goes to charity. Plus, she used to go down to the deep sea tavern in our neighborhood and I can remember vividly seeing people in the bars as, when I was a kid you know they weren't not really supposed to be in there but you know and I look at these people now some of them were having kind of a good time you know but a lot of them are just sitting there at the bar you know they always got that big mirror back there and they're sitting there drinking, just kind of looking at themselves, and they're just miserable. A pity party. There's a tear in my beer, because I'm crying for you, dear. And so as I'm looking at this scene, an, another thought comes to me. I'm miserable enough right now. Why should I make myself more miserable? I have no desire to go out and to get drunk. That's not a part of my makeup anymore. And so, then it's just like God then said, well, have you had enough of that kind of thinking? And it's just like, I guess I have. Just, Turned it off, left it in God's hands. How in the world do I get into that? Except for to say, there are things in my life, and I know there's things in your life, that you will never, ever do again. Those are milestones. Those are markers. Landmarks. And, if, and he that has begun a good work in us is going to bring it to completion. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. Turn to Luke chapter, chapter 17. The kingdom of God is you. 
you rule in these bodies that he has given you. Because how many know, until we come to know the Lord, someone else or something else was ruling us. Amen? We just got so used to it, we thought it was us. But we were deceived. Luke 17, verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not, with observation, neither shall they say, Lo, here or lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. He has given you the kingdom, the right to rule and to reign over what you allow to rule your life. When contrary thoughts come, you then can just let them continue to rule or you can resist them and they have to flee. Draw nigh unto God and what? He'll draw nigh unto you. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You have power with him to rule what goes on in these bodies. Are we going to allow lust to rule? Are we going to allow fear to, work, to rule? Are we going to allow unbelief to rule? Worry? Stress? If somebody don't like us, are we going to worry about that? Or just... That's their problem. Do good to those that do evil to you. Amen? Amen? was thinking we know of a we know of a new church that has just started up and the whole history of it is one split right after another and all there is is drama when we have the power to just not engage ourselves in that. Right. And we might be small. And you know, Jim and I have had our disagreements and stuff. But you know what? We don't break rank. We all think a little differently. Can somebody say amen? Yes. A little way of expressing ourselves. A little way of looking at things. you know we're here and there's no strife among us all the enemies try to throw it up here or there but you know what we have power we can just let God sort the whole thing out you don't have to like me but you know what I'm going to like you anyway Somehow, that's, that's the nature of God that I see in Jesus. People may talk about me. Well, I can't help that. But you know what I can help? Not talking about them. Not worrying about them. This, and I know it takes a while to be able to do that. When I was a younger Christian, it bothered me. You know, it, it really did, you know what. But then, after a while, you know, you just kind of 
those things kind of lose their importance. The kingdom of God is within us. We can rule what thoughts are trying to come in and rule us. We can rule over our attitudes. Amen? And as we do, we find we can even rule over sicknesses that try to come in and rule. Now, we live in these bodies. Some, we got to take care of them. Can somebody say amen? Uh, we're stewards over them. But you know what? When we have done what we know we can do, we trust God. We trust God. I really don't like the idea of having to go to a dentist. But you know what I'm going to do tomorrow? I'm going to go to a dentist. And it's going to be the grace of God that keeps me in there. Because I ain't looking forward to it. But I know if whatever other things God I went through that have been unpleasant, I've just trusted in God and I got through them just fine. I'll get through this just fine. We got to worry. I mean, we got to rule over worry. We got to rule over anxiety. You know, you start ruling over these things where they can't work in you. You start lengthening your life. Because those things are what cause us to age. Oh, I know aging's a natural process, but I'll tell you what, part of that process is all the worry and stress we do in the in the middle of it. Amen. The more we trust in God, the more we rest in Him, our bodies work better. Oh, praise the Lord. He has given us the kingdom. But in order to rule with Him in this kingdom, we've got to believe what He has done and who He says we are. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. I don't know how far we're going to get this morning. But turn with me to 2 Samuel, chapter 5. I will probably go in some of these scriptures uh, in another message. But we have preached them enough. How many are number one? We know this, that, if our, that our old man was crucified with him. Romans 6, 6. Amen. Amen. That the body of sin might be destroyed. What is the body of sin? The body of sin is that which the old man created. How many know that we are both masculine and feminine? The masculine part of us is the spirit. Until we come to know the Lord, the original spirit that was put in us, somebody say God. John 4. God is what? Spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him what? In spirit and truth. And that word truth when you look it up in the Greek, it means in reality. In reality. Worship God in reality, not in religion. Amen. Be real. Not just putting on an image of the way you think you're supposed to be, or the way others think you're supposed to be. Be real. But God is 
spirit. Amen? Amen? Okay, now I'm very simplistic. I have even been told so by some. Well, you just, you just, you just simple-minded. I am simple-minded. I think that's a great benefit because it causes me to believe the Word of God for what it really says. God is spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 says there's how many spirits? God is spirit. There's only one spirit. How many know there is a spirit in man? The candle of the Lord. Well, that's a human spirit. Wait a second. Paul said in Ephesians, there's only one spirit. John 4 says God is spirit. Then the spirit in man is God. God don't speak to my spirit. God is the spirit. He speaks to my soul. To my mind. To my perception. Now to a lot of people that's heresy. But that's literally what the Bible says. Adam was awakened by that spirit. But God spoke to him the Spirit, and said, In the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. I've told this story I don't know how many times. One day I was studying that, and I went to the Strong's Concordance to see what the Hebrew word is for die. You know what it was? To die. That's it. Well, well so I'm, I, I'm too dumb to know what that means. I'll go to Webster's Dictionary and see what Webster has to say. And there is several definitions. I want to say eight, but, uh, but there are was, there was several de de uh, definitions. And one of them just leaped right out of me. Die meant to lose the force. To lose the force. As long as God was functioning in Adam, Adam could not die. Not spiritually, not physically. But the very moment he ate of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, he died. He was spiritually cut off from God. Amen. He was cut off from his spirit. His spirit didn't go anywhere. Amen? Amen. But he was separated from it. He could not sense it anymore. Sin had separated him from God. This is pretty simple. But when he did that, how many know he allowed something else to take its place? The logic of the serpent. The logic of the serpent. And you know what the logic of the serpent was? Yeah, well, the logic of the serpent was, you won't surely die, because God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, the, your eyes will be opened. But what was he telling him? You... What you look like is what you are. You're just human. But in your humanity, 
You've got everything you need to rule your life. Amen. But the point was, all you need is what you've been created to be in the natural. What does man teach today? Same thing. Amen. We want, we want, we want just we want to get God out of our thinking. We can set our own standards. Yeah. When you look at yourself, what do you see? In the natural. You see good and evil. Amen? You can see some good there. Amen? But you can also see some evil. It causes you to be double-minded. A double-minded is man is what? Unstable in all his ways. Now, without God, we aren't good. Can somebody say amen? But in God, we are good. What did he say when he, every, every day after he created what he created in each of the seven uh, areas, when he ended, he said, and God saw and it was good. It was a serpent that said, you are good and evil. But that doesn't matter. You can rule yourself. Come on. God doesn't know in the day you eat thereof. You'll be like Him. You can make decisions for yourself. Whether He approves or don't approve. Now, Adam, after he had fallen, was separated from the original spirit, God, he still remained a man of God because he knew he sinned and he blew it. But that's when God shared his plan that the seed of a woman, Christ, would bruise the head of the serpent. But it was then that the serpent, his way of thinking, took over mankind and operated as a spirit in man. Amen? Amen. So that we get to Ephesians chapter 2. It says, well, let me just read it. I'm trying to bring his this to a close today but I'm just going to we'll get to uh, Samuel probably next week how am I getting something out of this this morning though Ephesians chapter 2 starting in verse 1 and you Hath he quickened? Now, in the original, this hath he quickened isn't there because it's in italics. But a few verses down, it shows up where it is there. So, it's valid for them to translate it like this because it's in the thought. Amen? How many are with me? So since it's written that way, and I know it's in the thought, because it's going to show up in a, in a couple scriptures down, I'm just going to read it the way it's in the King James. And you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. How did he make you alive? By removing your sin that separated you 
from him. So that now you are conscious and aware of your spirit, which is him. Amen? Now, because Adam separated himself from God by the choice he made, he still was dead. He repented of his sin. God shared with him there was a time he would be redeemed. But until then, he's dead. Now, it took 900 and some years for what he did by separating himself from the Spirit to affect his physical body and his body physically die. But had he never made that wrong choice, his body would have never Instead, he was subject to what he saw, what appeared, his humanity, its weaknesses, its diseases that wouldn't have been there if he hadn't made the wrong choice. Amen? You know what? Jesus brought the reversal. On the cross, he paid the price. He died as us. So that we are now rejoined to Him, the Spirit that is in us. Because we were not conscious of that Spirit, how many know He had to come in on the day of Pentecost, and, then, and, and when we responded to Him, He came in outwardly, Spirit, to rekindle that Spirit within us, which is Him. That's why there was a particular manifestation on the day of Pentecost. It said before they, before they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they began speaking in tongues, what happened? There appeared cloven tongues of fire upon each of their heads. Why that manifestation? Because the Spirit of the Lord is what? The candle of the Lord. Yeah, and the Spirit is fire. What was he doing? He was lighting the candle. The Spirit was now functional again within man. And now that that Spirit's functional within man, man now is joined to that Spirit. He that is joined unto the Spirit is what? One Spirit. Oh, praise the Lord. We were made alive with the potential as we discover who we really are in Him and begin to rule in this kingdom, the last enemy that's going to be destroyed is physical death. Amen? He's already taken care of initial death, separation from Him. We have now been made one, reconciled. Amen? Amen? But as we walk in our identity, who we are, and we start ruling over what has been ruling here, the last enemy is going to be destroyed as physical death. And along the way, we're going to get rid of sickness, disease, depression, all these things. Oh, praise the Lord. Well, let me continue to read here. Where in time past, what's it? And you, Athy Quicken, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the Spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What is the spirit that is working in unregenerated man to those that are not born again? 
It's the devil. It's the prince of the power of the air. It is that carnal mind. Amen? It is the beast. Well, I thought there was only one spirit. There is only one real spirit. How many know the spirit of disobedience is a false spirit? A false spirit's not a real spirit. So therefore, it doesn't change the fact there's only one real spirit. How many know there's a such a thing as counterfeit money? It's not real. But you know what? If you don't know. Well, there's only one real spirit, and that spirit is God, but there is a false spirit. A real spirit can never, ever die or fade away. It is always constant and eternal. But you know, that's not the case of the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Oh, praise the Lord. I wasn't going to get into any of this stuff, but how many remember the passing the buck there in Genesis chapter 3? Who told you you were naked? He said, well, he said, did you eat of the tree that I told you not to eat of? Well, the woman you gave me, she gave to me and I did eat. Well, that's true. That doesn't get him off the hook. But he was also supposed to keep the garden. Amen? So he's Looks to the woman and says, is this true? Well, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Well, that's true too. So he goes to the serpent and he says, well, you know the story. He says, on thy belly shalt thou go. Amen? Now, you got to know this is all symbolic stuff. The promise was that the seed of the woman, Christ, would bruise the head of the serpent. I looked up that word, on thy belly shalt thou go, the word belly. And it said, in the Strong's Concordance, it says, it is the external abdomen, particularly of a pregnant woman. How does the serpent exist? By reproducing himself generation after generation, speaking the same lie. On thy belly shalt thou go. A thought comes. A contrary thought. But man believes that thought. So that attitude, that way of thinking, becomes his way of thinking. Amen? Amen. That seed has reproduced himself in another generation. But when Jesus came... He stopped the process. Because in reconciling us, redeeming us, making it possible that we could be rejoined to God, another way of thinking started coming into us. Amen. The mind of Christ. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And as we let this mind be in us, the more we think like he thinks, the less we think. 
like the serpent thinks. So, well, I still see the devil around. Yeah, because people still believe his lies. But you know what? More and more, as a people demonstrate the nature of God and think with the mind of Christ, more and more people are going to start believing, receiving what Jesus has done. And guess what? What he started there at Calvary and by coming to live in his people and rejoining them to the God within them, the more they start thinking with the mind of Christ, the less the serpent seed of lies until one day there is no more seed of the serpent because nobody is around that will believe his lies. When that happens, pew, he can't reproduce himself. He can't exist. On thy belly shalt thou go. Oh, praise the Lord. I had no idea I was going to get into all that. But the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience once worked in us, but he hath made us alive rejoined us to the Spirit of God, and now the process is reversing. Amen. And we are starting to rule this kingdom instead of Him. Now, I'm just going to give a preview of where we're going to go. God told the children of Israel, there was a promised land given to them. Amen. Not to them, it was a natural land. God reminded them of that promise until there finally was a king, King Saul. King Saul wasn't the one that God ordained. Can somebody say amen? But that's who the people wanted. God gave him Saul. But then Saul was replaced by David. By this time, they are living in the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem today speaks of the church. And we are the church. Amen. But did you know, even though they were given the promised land, the kingdom of God, Amen? They were given that. They had to take it. When David started ruling in Jerusalem, and we're going to get in, into the scriptures on this, when David started ruling in Jerusalem, the highest mountain in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, was held by the Jebusites. All the land around there that David was ruling, he couldn't even rule in his own city. All the time they, that Israel had dwelt in Jerusalem, the highest mountain was still held by the Jebusites. They once had all of Jerusalem. In fact, the name Jebusite comes from the name Jebsu, Jebsu, who was, which was the, uh, it was a man, it was a Canaanite, and they were his sons, and, and then of course became a nation of people. But they were the ones who once inhabited Jerusalem, only it wasn't called Jerusalem, it was called Jebsu. And David comes in, Saul had been there, all the years of Saul, Jebusites, Still ruled. It was just on Mount Zion. Now David's become king. Guess who's still there? But you know what David does? He believes the word of God. And they go up. And they take Mount Zion. They destroy the Jebusites. 
And they take hold of Mount Zion. And it begins to be called the city of David. Oh, praise the Lord. My whole point is, right now, right now, the kingdom of God has been given to us. The kingdom of God is within you. It's what we allow rule our outward expression. The old man, because of the spirit that was working in him, the false spirit that was working within him, created this body of sin. This body that expresses sinful behavior. Amen. Therefore brings forth physically death. But you know something? That city. We as scripture. And this is where I'm want, wanting to go to. If we believe the word of God. We have been changed. What we are wrestling with is not ourselves. We're wrestling with spirits, false spirits, principalities and powers, a spirit of wickedness, ruling where? In high places. Where are they ruling at? Mount Zion. But we have been given the kingdom we can take back. What's Zion? The high place. It speaks of our mind, our way of thinking. We can take over the attitudes and the thoughts that we give ourselves and make and, uh, uh, until they're no longer sinful, but they're godly. When that happens, guess what happens to the body of sin? It's destroyed. Amen? And it's replaced by a new body. Not just physically, a whole new expression of ourself where we once were sinners, now we're the righteousness of God. And it makes a complete change. So, it isn't automatic, but we have give, been given the city, and if we'll rise up to the occasion... We can pull down strongholds. We can pull down those things that are contrary to God. And when we see our true identity, how many know we can take Mount Zion? Oh, hallelujah. And we can rule the whole city. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm just going to quit right there and pray that that... Is,